T.S. Eliot uh, wrote The Wasteland in 1921. Uh, mostly he wrote it in England, where by that time he had settled permanently. It was first published in a British literary magazine that Eliot himself edited called The Criterion. It was first published in October of 1922. The early 1920s were a difficult time in England. Difficult time politically, a difficult time economically. Like most good wars, uh, the war of 1914 to 1918 had created an employment boom. But after the war ended, that employment boom ended with it and left, uh, in the wake of it, over two million people unemployed in England itself. There's a coalition government only vaguely in charge at the time. Not much further in the background of the poem is the Great War itself, with 10 million people dead and much of Western Europe in ruin. By 1918, uh, much of the countryside in Europe that had been the inspiration for generations of European artists, painters, musicians, and poets was in ruins. It was quite literally, by this point, a wasteland. Buildings were destroyed that had stood for over a millennia. If you go to the Hart House on this campus, and go to the chapel that's on the ground floor, go down in there sometime and have a look at the stained glass windows that are in the Hart House Chapel. Those windows were put together with scraps from broken stained glass windows in European churches destroyed by shelling in the First World War. The pieces were brought back to the University of Toronto by graduates and students of this university who were serving in the First World War. And they brought the pieces back here and they were reassembled into new frames in the Hart House Chapel. A new kind of thought chipped away at people's recourse to the old explanations for war. Darwin, Marx, Freud, and others were slowly forcing people to accept that wars had less to do with angry gods than they had to do with angry humans. Past wars, particularly in England, past wars had their glory. It became increasingly difficult to see the glory in the First World War. For Wilfred Owen and other creators of an entirely new kind of poetry, trench poetry, a generation had been sentenced to death by their parents for a few acres of mud. In a poem that Eliot published uh, two years before The Wasteland, in 1920, an old man sits alone in an empty house and he asks himself, after such knowledge, what forgiveness? After such knowledge, what forgiveness? That's the question that Eliot attempted to answer in The Wasteland, published two years after that. After such knowledge, what forgiveness? The Wasteland is a collection of fragments. There are five parts in the poem. The connections between these parts are far from apparent. And within those parts, there are many smaller fragments. The fragments are not just Eliot's. There are images, uh, quotations, entire lines that are taken from other writers, dozens of other writers. There are over 60 different allusions in the wasteland to over 40 different writers um, in a half dozen different languages, past, present, modern, ancient, western, eastern. The wasteland is the poetic equivalent of those broken stained glass windows reassembled in the Hart House Chapel. It's bits of culture broken up by war and reassembled into a new frame. Before the war, uh, when they were still intact, when those stained glass windows in the European churches were still intact, they looked out onto a single view. They told a single accessible story. Maybe one of them depicted the life of a saint or the crucifixion of Christ. But they told one story, clearly. If you took all those windows, all those single stories, and you smashed them to bits, and you put them in a bag, and you shook them up, and you threw them on the wall, you'd get the wasteland. 
It's the same thing as those windows in the Hard House Chapel. There is not a single view in the wasteland. There is no single clear view. There is no single voice in the wasteland, no single story. What we get instead is many views, many voices, each reflecting and refracting the other, much like Cuba's painting, which is arising at the same time. If we perceive the world as ordered, as meaningful, then we will make and respond to art that is itself meaningful and ordered. But if the world is in ruins, if history, culture, lies broken in trenches, the bottom of Western Europe, then we will make and respond to art that imitates that disorder. Humans are art-making animals. That's what we are. Don't take my word for it. Ask Aristotle, ask Hegel, ask Sartre. Art-making animals. If fragments are all we have left, then we will make art of fragments. I want to give you one other way to think about the form of the wasteland, uh, a way that is suggested by the poem itself. The Judeo-Christian tradition has several stories of prophets who speak in tongues, people who are taken over by a divine agent that speaks through them, even though they don't know the language or even often what they're saying. There's a condition uh, that is very similar to this in the Buddhist tradition that Eliot invokes in part five of the wasteland, and that is uh, nirvana. In Buddhism, uh, nirvana is the, the peace, the wisdom, that is won by those who are no longer a self. They are an empty receptacle. The passions have left them. They have been blown out, which is what the word nirvana means. Eliot had his own word for this state of being. Uh, he called it, in fact, developed an entire theory of poetry out of it, a theory that he called the impersonal theory of poetry. The impersonal theory of poetry. See, for Eliot, the secret to writing real poetry, to writing a great poem, was not to become more personal, more individual, the way the romantic poets had, to express the personality in the poem. For Eliot, the secret to real poetry was exactly the opposite of that. What he strove for was what he called the continual extinction of the personality. By suppressing his own emotions, his own personality, the idea behind Eliot's theory, as well as that behind surrealist art at the same time, was that the poet, the artist, could access experiences common to everyone. Because they were no longer a self, no longer a person, but a vehicle for the collective. And that is what Eliot is trying to do in the wasteland, to speak in and through many different voices, none of them his, all of them ours, our inheritance. There is no single speaker in the wasteland. That's what makes it so tremendously difficult to read, what makes it so tremendously difficult for most of the poetry of the time, even most of Eliot's other poems himself. The voice in the anonymous is a not, the voice in the wasteland, I should say, is anonymous. It's collective. The, uh, the working title for this famous poem was He Do the Police in Different Voices. It's the working title that Eliot had for the poem. It comes from a line in a Dickens novel, Our Mutual Friend, in which two characters are discussing how one of their friends reads stories aloud from the newspaper. And one of the characters says that I like the way he reads them because he do the police in different voices. The world should be thankful that Eliot changed his mind about the title. <laughs> the Wasteland speaks in many voices because Eliot is attempting to represent an inclusive human consciousness. That is what Eliot thought popular culture meant. He didn't think popular culture meant film, television, both of which he despised, 
with the exception of Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> For Eliot, popular culture is shared culture. It's rooted in ritual, in a largely unconscious, shared sense of belonging. A sense that to him in the 1920s, as a consequence of the First World War, was largely in tatters, but was still there. The big problem with Eliot's theory of impersonal poetry in a poem that is as long as the wasteland is that all of these fragments, all these voices need something to hold them together. People are generally not happy accepting disorder, whether in a poem or in life. Eliot himself was not happy with disorder. Throughout his life, Eliot longed for order and for meaning in a way that only a truly committed skeptic can. He wrote about what he saw. And what Eliot saw in the 1920s was not capital T truth. What he saw was many different truths, broken up and fragmented by war. But he also, at the same time, hoped that there might be some order beyond individual experience, some meaning to life that was common, collective. He later found this order for himself in the church. But for himself, at this point in time, he's not looking for it in religion. He's looking for that order in literature and in myth. For the wasteland, he found a great deal of this order in a single book. Jesse L. Weston's from Ritual to Romance, a book called From Ritual to Romance, published just two years before The Wasteland in 1920. In his notes to the poem, Eliot tells us that he got the title, uh, the plan, and a great deal of the symbolism for The Wasteland from Weston's book. Weston's book, From Ritual to Romance, is a book about the Holy Grail, about the quest for the Holy Grail. It's a legendary talisman that has been the object of questing adventures from Parsifal to Indiana Jones. Nobody really knows the origins of the Grail, or even what it really is. The most well-known story, of course, is that it's the cup that Christ drank from at the Last Supper, and later used to collect his blood as he died on the cross. But it is generally believed now that the Grail substantially predates Christianity, that it originates in pagan fertility rituals in which the Grail was a female sex symbol used in accompaniment with its male counterpart, the Bleeding Lance. In the Christian tradition, the Bleeding Lance becomes the spear that wounded Christ on the cross. There's a, a recent book a few years ago by a, a professor in the history department here at the University of Toronto, uh, Professor Joseph Goring, who has suggested a new explanation for the origin of the Grail, and that is that apparently there were paintings discovered in churches in the Pyrenees, and these paintings depicted Mary holding a, a vessel that emits light, and nobody knew what the vessel was, so poets made up stories about the vessel that became the legend of the Holy Grail, hence Dan Brown. What caught Eliot's eye about all this was the way that Le Weston linked the story of the Grail to another world myth, and that's the story of the Fisher King, the legend of the Fisher King. It is also one of those stories that have been told many different times by many different cultures in many different places. It's a world myth, what Joseph Campbell would call a world myth, like the myth of the flood. This is one version of it. Uh, this is a from the 12th century French poem about Parsifal and the quest for the Holy Grail. You can see Parsifal on your left and the lance and the grail on the right. The basic elements of the Fisher King story are this. Uh, the death, illness, or sometimes just the old age of the Fisher King brings drought and sterility to the land. The idea is that the health of the king is associated with the health of the land because the king is divine. So the wasteland that is created as a consequence of the illness of the king 
can only be revived by a questing knight. It has to be the right sort of knight. The knight has to be pure of heart. He has to be purified before he can do the, complete the task. The knight has to find both the grail and the bleeding lance, and he has to ask questions of them. And if he asks the right questions, the health of the king will be restored, and the wasteland will come back to life. There are references to this legend that are scattered throughout the poem, throughout the poem, The Wasteland. But the main function of them is more in behind the scenes. Because what the story of the Fisher King does for Eliot is that it provides the poem, and by extension, the world, with the order that it lacks. What this story allowed Eliot to do was to suggest that beneath the broken cobblestones of the streets of European cities, beneath the modern city, beneath the wasteland, there is an old story, a story that we all know, a story that we all share, even though it's now in pieces. Before you go in, you should probably read the sign that's hanging over the door of the wasteland, and that is the epigraph. The epigraph is in Latin. Um, the first difficulty of a tremendously difficult poem. It is uh, taken from a Roman manuscript from the first century AD called the Satyricon. Now, the thing about this manuscript is that the manuscript itself, in Eliot's time as in ours, only exists in fragments. So Eliot is beginning this fragmented poem with a fragment a ruin from the past. What the epigraph is about is a character called the Sibyl, the Sibyl of Cumae. The Sibyl is a prophet. She's a, most famously, she's the gatekeeper to the gates of hell, um, the underworld in Virgil's Aeneid. What happened to the Sibyl, it's a lesson for all of us, the Sibyl asked the gods for as many years of life as there were grains of sand in her hand. And they granted her wish. Unfortunately, the Sibyl forgot to ask for eternal youth along with eternal life. <laughs> so she ages tremendously and forever. Uh, her most well-known appearance in Western literature is in Virgil's Aeneid, um, the story of the founder of Rome. Aeneas of Troy. She guides Aeneas into the underworld and shows him Rome's future glory. But Eliot's quote from the Satyricon is about the Sibyl many, many years after that famous event when she is now drastically aged, though still alive. And in English, the quotation reads something like this. My translation, so forgive it. I saw with my own eyes the Sibyl at Cumae suspended in a cage. And when the boys asked her, Sybil, what do you want? She replied, I want to die. So guarding the entrance to the wasteland is a prophet who can see the future. And she wants to die. Think about that before you decide whether or not you want to enter the wasteland. The epigraph does a great deal more than simply warn the reader of what's to come or set the tone for the poem. What it also does is align this poem with other poems through allusion. First and most obviously to the Satyricon itself, but also to Virgil's Aeneid, because the Sibyl is a principal character in the Aeneid, and also by extension to Dante's Divine Comedy, because Virgil becomes the principal character, a principal character in the Divine Comedy. What allusions do for Eliot in this poem, starting with this one, is connect this modern story with all of those old stories to suggest that it is part of those stories. The many allusions that occur in the wasteland are partly multiple perspectives on the same scene. They're like a cubist painting, different voices telling the same story from entirely different angles. But the thing is that because allusion in a literary work or artistic work, because allusion expands meaning, because it connects this story with the story to which it refers, 
all those different voices in the poem from other poems allowed Eliot, as I.A. Richards famously said, to write an epic in 433 lines. You follow? Because it's extending, it's claiming the whole of Western and a great deal of Eastern literature as part of its terrain. This poem is significantly larger than this poem because it's all poems. Okay, first stop. Part one, I'm in the fourth stanza, about line 60. We're in London. This is the final fragment in the first part. Unreal city under the brown fog of a winter dawn. A crowd flowed over London Bridge. So many. I had not thought death had undone so many. Sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet, flowed up the hill and down King William Street, to where St. Mary Woolnoth kept the hours with a dead sound on the final stroke of nine. There I saw one I knew and stopped him, crying, Stetson, you who were with me in the ships at Malai, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Or has the sudden frost disturbed its bed? Oh, keep the dog far hence that's friend to men, or with his nails he'll dig it up again. You, hypocrite lecture, mon semblable, mon frère. A crowd flowed under London Bridge. Where's the crowd going? They're going to work. These people are commuters. St. Mary Walnut strikes the hour of nine. This particular section of the poem is set in London's financial district, what Londoners just call the city. And this is where Eliot worked at the time that he was writing the poem because the man who wrote The Wasteland was at the same time an investment banker with Lloyd's of London. In Eliot's city, in Eliot's time, I should say, this part of London, the city, capital C city, is being depopulated. Residents are leaving the downtown core and moving to the new suburbs of London. So by Eliot's time, over a million commuters a day are entering and leaving an area of the city that's less than one square mile. It's new. It had not been seen before. And it struck Eliot as it struck many that something was changing. The lines here also echo Dante's Inferno. Dante says that he had not thought death had undone so many about not a crowd of commuters. He says this about a crowd of people who are waiting outside the gates of hell. People who could not choose, people who did not do good or evil because they could not choose. And that illusion helps Eliot suggest the main idea of the wasteland, which is that old stories lie beneath modern streets. London is Rome. London is Athens. London is Alexandria. London is Dante's hell. The difference repeatedly is that those old stories, those old places, were meaningful, authentic, real. In the wasteland, the new versions of these old stories are lighter, lesser, emptied of meaning. Dante says, I had not thought death had undone so many about a crowd of people waiting outside the gates of hell. Eliot says it about a group of commuters. Think of your morning commute on the subway and each man fixed his eyes before his feet. I had not thought death had undone so many. In this modern Rome, faith, the church, is just a time clock. The rituals, the stories that hold people together are in pieces. The wasteland uses illusion to select its readers over and over again. The last line of this section, the line of French that I read, is a line from Charles Baudelaire's The Flowers of Evil. It says, you, hypocrite reader, my double, 
my brother. What the wasteland is suggesting over and over again with these, wasteland, with these illusions is that if you can read this line, if you know this line, then you feel what I feel because you know too that the past that I'm evoking here is now in fragments. For many, many readers, including almost all of my students, the illusions in the wasteland do not open the poem up the way I was talking a moment ago. The illusions close it down. They make it hard to read and almost impossible to understand or even enjoy. T.S. Eliot wrote in this poem, but at my back in a cold blast I hear the rattle of the bones and chuckle spread from ear to ear. It is an allusion to Andrew Marvell's poem to his coy mistress, in part three of the poem, excuse me. Eliot's British critic, Harold Monroe, wrote, but at my back I always hear Mr. Eliot's intellectual sneer. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But the thing is that the difficulty of Eliot's illusions are part of their function. The wasteland is a kind of test. If you get enough of the illusions in the wasteland, then you will share Eliot's despair. Because you obviously know the tradition whose death he is lamenting. Probably the most radical step that the wasteland takes, that modernist poetry takes, is that it is not at all interested in talking to everybody. It has a specific audience in mind, and it will leave most readers behind as a consequence of that. <coughs> Second stop, part two, a game of chess. This is about line 139. We're overhearing now a conversation that takes place in a bar. This should be in a Cockney accent. When I do Cockney, I sound like what I am, which is a drunk Irishman, so I'm not even going to attempt it. When Lil's husbands got demobbed, I said, I didn't mince my words. I said to her myself, hurry up, please, it's time. Now Albert's coming back. Make yourself a bit smart. He'll want to know what you've done with that money he gave you to get yourself some teeth. He did. I was there. You have them all out, Lil, and get a nice set. He said, I swear, I can't bear to look at you. And no more can't I, I said. And think of poor Albert. He's been in the Army four years. He wants a good time, and if you don't give it him, there's others will, I said. Oh, is there, she said. Something of that, I said. Then I'll know who to thank, she said, and give me a straight look. Hurry up, please, it's time. If you don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't. But if Albert makes off, it won't be for lack of telling. You ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique. And her only 31. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. She's had five already, nearly died a young George. The chemist said it would be all right, but I've never been the same. You are a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What you get married for if you don't want children? Hurry up, please, it's time. Well, that Sunday, Albert was home. They had a hot gammon, and they asked me into dinner to get the beauty of it hot. Hurry up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, it's time. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night, Tata. Good night, good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night, good night. This is a snapshot of what the working classes are doing in the wasteland. We're not in the banking district of London anymore. We're overhearing women gossiping in a pub. We overhear one woman telling her friend about another friend, Lil. And she says she's told Lil, look, your husband's come back from the war. Clean yourself up a bit. Maybe get yourself some new teeth. Lil says, it's not my fault that I look old. It's them pills I took to bring it off. She's had an abortion. Over top of this conversation, we hear another voice, a refrain repeated in capital letters. Hurry up, please, it's time. 
What that is most immediately is the traditional last call, the British bartender. That's all he's doing. It's the bartender telling them it's time to go. You can keep drinking, but you can't keep drinking here. But it also, of course, suggests and anticipates the very traditional poetic theme of carpe diem, seize the day. Hurry up, please, it's time. Two women talking in a bar about false teeth with a voice in the background saying, it's time. Something is coming. Something is happening. What? We don't know. Nothing but more time in the wasteland. So they leave the bar. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night, good night. Those are the last words spoken by Ophelia in Shakespeare's Hamlet after she's gone mad, just before she dies, by drowning, like many of the other deaths in the wasteland. So Ophelia's tragic parting words, one of the most beautiful scenes in Western literature, are now words overheard in a bar in a conversation about false teeth. Old stories beneath the modern, stories in fragments, a culture in ruins. Everything that was once meaningful has been emptied of meaning. Shakespeare in modern England is just fodder for pop songs. Ooh, that Shakespearean rag, earlier in the poem. The ancient poetic theme of Carpe Diem, seize the day, has become last call in a pub. Hurry up, please, it's time. In Andrew Marvell's England, the graves a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. In the modern England, Fix your teeth or you won't get any. Last stop, last part, what the thunder said. Uh, Eliot wrote the final part of The Wasteland in a small town in France. He told Virginia Woolf um, that he wrote it in a kind of trance, um, finally relaxed, freed from the pressures of work. He describes part five in his notes as the approach to the chapel perilous. So what has happened in terms of the myth of the Fissure King is the night has now been purified. Early in the poem, he's had his feet washed. He's been purified by water and by fire. And the night is now, in the final part of the poem, approaching the chapel where the grail is. Before he gets there, and before we get there, we have to cross through hostile lands, the, the, the difficult passage of romance. About line 330 in the final part of the wasteland. Start at the beginning of the part five. After the torchlight, red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, the shouting and the crying, prison, palace, and reverberation of thunder of spring over distant mountains. He who was living is now dead. We who were living are now dying with a little patience. Here is no water but only rock, rock and no water and the sandy road, the road winding above among the mountains, which are mountains of rock without water. If there were water, we should stop and drink. Amongst the rock, one cannot stop or think. Sweat is dry and feet are in the sand. If there were only water amongst the rock, dead mountain mouth of carious teeth that cannot spit. Here one can neither stand nor lie nor sit. There is not even silence in the mountains, but dry, sterile thunder without rain. There is not even solitude in the mountains, but red, sullen faces sneer and snarl from doors of mud-cracked houses. The difficult passage of romance, the final passage before the entrance to the chapel, which he arrives at a few stanzas after that scene. Now I say he, but it is tremendously uncertain who this person is, or even if it's more than one person. Eliot says in the notes to the poem that all the men in the poem are one man, just as all the women in the poem are one woman. 
So at the chapel, it finally rains. Water is returned to the wasteland. When it rains, thunder comes. The thunder speaks. It says one word. The thunder says, da, die, da. And where Elliot got this particular old story from is from the East. He got it from the Upanishads, the Hindu Upanishads, a sacred text from about the 9th century BC. Elliot studied Sanskrit at Harvard. Um, I did not, so I will mangle the pronunciation of the words that follow. Um, the story here is that gods, men, and demons all assemble in front of their creator, Prajapati, God. And they all ask at the same time. They all say, speak to us, O Lord. What's the meaning of life? Speak to us, O Lord. Brajapati, the creator, responds with one word, da. This is all from the Upanishads. The problem is, is that all three groups hear da differently, or perhaps just interpret it differently. Men hear data, give. Demons here, dayadva, be compassionate, be compassionate. Gods here, control yourselves. One word, three different interpretations by three groups, which resolves none of the difficulties between them. Now with the warning that I am simplifying for the sake of summary here, this is my best sense of what happens at the end of the wasteland. At the chapel, the thunder, Prajapati, the creator, God, whatever name you want to give him, speaks the word of power, Da. Da is the answer. It's the holy grail. It is the meaning that is missing from the poem and missing from the world. The problem is nobody quite knows what it means. And so the poem ends with not one, but three different interpretations of what the answer is before decaying into a babble of different voices in four different languages at the very end of the poem. At the end of the poem, the fisher king is fishing. I sat upon the shore fishing. So maybe the night has been successful. Maybe the king has been restored to health and with it the wasteland. The king is described as fishing with the wasteland, with the arid plain, I should say, behind me. So the wasteland is still there, but now it's behind him, not in front of us. The king, if that's who it is, wonders at this point, should I put my lands in order? An allusion to Isaiah. Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die. Through the babble of the last stanza, we hear the final words of the wasteland. One word repeated three times. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. It's again Sanskrit. Uh, the word shanti means peace, means silence. As Eliot says in his notes, shanti is the Buddhist equivalent of the Christian peace that passeth understanding, or of nirvana for that matter. Now, the problem for us, the, the problem for all readers of the wasteland is this. It's very simple. The peace that passes understanding, passes understanding. You know, it can be experienced, but it cannot be understood. It cannot be shared, and it certainly cannot be paraphrased, not by me. You either get it, or you don't. It is possible that whoever hears these words at the end of the poem has reached nirvana, peace. But if so, it's not accessible or even comprehensible to anybody else but that one individual, each of us locked inside our own prisons. In 1923, uh, Time magazine did a review of both Eliot's The Wasteland and James Joyce's Ulysses in the same review. Feel sorry for the reviewer. <laughs> the review opened up with, this, 
there is a new kind of literature abroad in the land whose only fault is that no one can understand it. <laughs> That's 1920s. By 1950, Eliot's poetry had become what poetry should look like. And now, Time Magazine put Eliot on the cover. This cover of Time Magazine, March of 1950, shows Eliot poised between a martini and a cross. The caption along the bottom reads, no middle way out of the wasteland. Two ways out of the wasteland, drug the census, alcohol, drugs, abandon the world of the census, faith. Eliot chose faith. Five years later, he found the order that he was looking for in the Church of England. He was baptized in secrecy behind closed doors in 1927. If it is peace that this poem attains at the end, then as Eliot says in his notes, it is a peace that passes understanding. It is private. It is behind a closed door. The meaning of the wasteland is ultimately individual, private. But that does not mean that it does not have meaning. For me, there is meaning in the wasteland. But the thing is, if I could tell you what that meaning was, I would not be here. I'd be up on top of a mountain somewhere in Nirvana. You know, me, Leonard Cohen, and Madonna, just blissing out. You know? <laughs> the wasteland is a literary monument. It is historically unavoidable. It's maybe the most important poem of the 20th century. It is also an excellent window on history. Eliot had an almost clairvoyant sense of his time, this uncanny ability to represent his time and how people felt about their time in words. 10 million people died in the First World War. Many of them used to be neighbors. Remember the anxiety generated by less than 3,000 senseless deaths on September the 11th. And then try to imagine what it must have felt like to wake up to a world that had lost 10 million. It is a cliche now to say that the Great War changed everything. But the thing is, it was not a cliche in 1918. It was new. It was frighteningly new. That sense of a bridge that had been permanently crossed, a divide forever between the past and this frightening new present, is what the wasteland and other shocking turns in Western art were trying to invoke. The world had changed, and art was scrambling to keep up. Although Eliot later denied it, the wasteland is in this sense a reflection of his time not just in the content, but in the fragmented form of the poem itself. But the thing is, Eliot did not just mirror his time. He also, and probably more crucially, taught his generation how to think of their time, how to see it. On the occasion of Eliot's 60th birthday, the British critic William Empson, who was 16 years old, when the poem came out in England. Empson said, I do not know for certain how much of my own mind he invented. I do not know for certain how much of my own mind he invented. That's a remarkable admission to make, right? On the part of anybody, let alone someone with the arrogance of a professor and scholar, attributing the invention of his own mind to another man. That's how that generation saw Eliot. The wasteland is crucially important for those who are interested in the past, as I am as you are. It is crucially important to both literary and cultural history. Is it still relevant to our time? Is it still a poem for our time? There are certainly legacies of Eliot in our time. We are much more comfortable, I believe, with fragments because of Eliot with mixing different styles and different periods in the same object. 
These fragments I have shored against my ruins. There are also Eliot's legacies of Eliot that we are less comfortable with. His representations of women, his anti-Semitism, his elitism, and probably for most, his role in the enthronement of difficulty as the central criteria of modern art. Eliot got some things wrong. For what it's worth, I think that he was mostly wrong about popular culture, what we now call popular culture. I think what Eliot could not see is that 95% of anything is crap. It doesn't matter if you're talking about old poems, the opera, or comic books or television. Only 5% of it is any good. But I think he got the main thing right, right for now, for our time. There is no capital T truth in the waistline. There's just different styles, different interpretations, laid side by side, living side by side, existing side by side, like those broken stained glass windows in Hart House, like the Renaissance wrong. But at the same time, Eliot also held out the hope that there is some sort of order beyond the flux of individual experience. An order and a meaning that is not necessarily known to us, not yet, but that is out there somewhere. Those conflicting positions towards the truth seem to me not unlike our own approach to truth, our own time. If we were truly as skeptical as the postmodernists once made us out to be, we wouldn't bother getting up in the morning, much less doing something so epistemologically unsound as education, as attending a lecture, for instance. I think that we are more like Eliot, that we are cynical enough, learned enough, experienced enough to doubt all answers, but optimistic enough to hope that we're wrong, <laughs> that there might be an answer. What T.S. Eliot is really lamenting in this poem is the loss of a shared culture, something that can hold us together. And I think that that is a concern that we can understand in 2009. Thank you very much.